Good morning. And um, yes, this has been a long time in the, the coming. I think this was done four years ago by a third year graduate student from Otago, um, Ivana uh, Rinklake here, who um, has subsequently gone on and finished a double masters over in pharmaceutical biotechnology in Europe. So put a bit of light into how far this is, um, how long ago this was in my memory bank, so I shall do my best to do Ivana justice um, on, on this talk. Um, so the talk came, the, the, the project has come about because uh, since joining Barenbrook um, Seed Company, one of the biggest issues in seed production for perennial ryegrass is endophytes. And how do you maintain your endophytes in your seed crop and get transmission at a high enough percentage that you can then sell the subsequent crop. And the number and varied reasons for why you lose endophyte, um, amongst them the genotype you're putting it in, um, your closing dates, your management, your physiology, all sorts of things. One of the issues that had always bothered me in the back of my head, a little conundrum, was does the vernalisation temperatures um, have anything to do with how the endophyte survives within the ryegrass. And if you think about it, most organisms have got their own cardinal temperature, the best temperature at which they grow. And we bring in, um, ryegrass over from Spain or other parts of Europe, and they are sexual beasts, and we can shift and select quite heavily the ryegrass to grow and survive in the New Zealand winters. However, the symbiont, the endophyte that lives in the ryegrass, is an asexual beast. And we don't have any ability to select or, or um, manipulate that. So we just have to live with the genotype that we've inherited from Europe. So you've got this conundrum where you've got a ryegrass host that's been heavily selected for survival and growth in, in the winter conditions in New Zealand versus an asexual symbiont, the endophyte that lives in there still thinks it's in the Mediterranean sunbathing on a nice hot beach. So how do we go about um, solving that conundrum or looking at that conundrum? And the wisdom that I was given when I came into this position was that, oh, it's all right, the endophyte catches up. And I thought, well, how do we know that the endophyte catches up and how do we, how do we test that? So, so that's something that's been in the back of my mind. And these Callaghan internships, which I will recommend and promote, allow you to have a student to come in and look at some of these little projects that you're thinking about. And so Ivana came in and we gave her this hypothesis, which was essentially, um, is the relative growth of the endophyte under vernalisation different to the relative growth of the endophyte when it's not under vernalisation in regard to the... Um, the plant tissue and um, and so that that's what we did and in order to to do that we set up quite a simple experimental design and this isn't designed to answer all things for all people it's just a very um, simple look and, and see at this process and um, and so the first thing we did was we, we, we grew some seedlings um, and then at 8 degree we lived, put them at 8 degrees C for 12 weeks and then we waited a few weeks and then we germinated some more seedlings and grew them at 20 degrees C for six weeks. And we had these then at the approximate same physiological state. They were the same size, the same shape, same architecture, essentially looked like the same, the same thing. And we took half of those seedlings and we analysed them for relative endophyte biomass compared to the plant tissue. And that was the, the first part of the experiment. In the second part of the experiment, we then took them out of this, in this case, a vernalisation treatment into a, a, a normal sort of um, summer conditions in Canterbury, and for this other one, again, the same. And then we harvested <coughs> the second half of the plants and, again, looked at the relative um, difference. So we've got cold to warm, or we've got cold versus warm, and then we've got cold to warm and warm to warm. So that's the two sort of experimental designs. So again, hopefully a, a reasonably straightforward experimental ap approach to that. And, and so that's what we set up, and then the student, um, Ivana, came in and, and, and helped set up these, uh, or undertook these analyses. Now, the analyses we, we tried to 
develop and do a little bit different to what's been done in, in the literature um, in some cases. We, we try to um, cover all of our bases, if you like, in terms of how we could analyse these relative growths. And we had this pipeline here where we would take this um, base tissue, um, tiller tissue, which is where you get the, the preponderance of the endophyte growing up into the, um, into the, the stem, and we would um, oven dry that. Uh, we'd have um, three tillers on each one. We'd weigh that. We'd bead bash it. And then we would either take a sample off for um, DNA extraction and then another sample off for protein um, extraction. And with the protein extraction, we could um, do the plant protein content and we could also look at the endophyte content through immunoblots. And um, we set up these immunoblots so that we had some serial dilutions, some positive negative controls, and then our test subjects. And we set up a small um, image J analysis program to measure the intensity of the dots. So we could get an idea of a, a, a pseudo quantification of the amount of endophyte via the immunoblotting, if you like. And then that allowed us to compare either just the plant protein to endophyte immunoblot ratio, um, uh, plant DNA to fungal DNA ratio. We could do qPCR on a chitinase gene versus qPCR on a, uh, a, plant, a plant gene. And, um, and one other thing that we could also do, which was, the, I guess, the point of difference in this experiment, was that we could go back to the weight and have an actual um, em, em endophyte immunoblock compared to um, per mass of, of plant tissue. And, and I think this is, this is probably a, a key bit as we, as we move forward. Um, most of the work previously has just been looking at the protein ratio. And... Um, and so what did we find uh, in the results? If we come up to the results here, um, in the first part of the experiment, the uh, experiment one, the cold versus the warm, uh, no matter how we analyzed the results, whether it was on a, a DNA ratio, an immunoblock protein ratio, or a per unit of plant tissue ratio, the warm conditions, the endophyte was relatively more abundant than in the cold conditions. So the cold conditions, the endophyte didn't grow as much as the warm conditions. And that's what we would have expected, that's what was written in the literature, and that's what the cardinal temperatures of the endophyte would suggest. So that was um, quite good. And our conclusions from that were that essentially the, the long cold versus the short warm didn't make any difference to the physiological nature of the, the ryegrass plants. So the ryegrass plants, essentially grew the same. They were at the, the, the point of measurement, they were physiologically at the same stage, but at those colder temperatures, the endophyte hadn't grown as much. So that was the first point, um, and, not, and, and nothing really unsurprising in that. So the next point was what happens after the vernalization. And so when we looked at the data after the vernalization, we got quite a different picture. And the key picture here is really this middle one. Um, if you look at it in regards to um, intensity um, of the immunoblock to the protein ratio, the cold one is completely the opposite to what we saw in the, the previous result. Um, whereas if you look at it on a per unit of tissue basis, the result's sort of similar, a bit less. And then on a DNA basis, it's sort of... Um, they're essentially all the same, there's no difference between them. So what you've got here is you've got different results depending on the measurement, the way you've measured your, your data. And to me, this was um, the surprising result. And, and it also then goes to say what, what's been done in the literature previously. As I said, the, the wisdom, the conventional wisdom, is that the endophyte catches up, don't worry about it. But that conventional wisdom was based on looking at the protein ratio. And if you look at the protein ratio, it sure does look as though the endophyte catches up, don't worry about it. But that doesn't seem to be actually what the case is. And so we had to come up with some explanation as to why we think this, this is happening. And what we noticed was that um, in the um, 
plant protein um, extraction, when you had the coal to warm, they had 3.8 to 5.3 times less soluble protein than from the warm to warm. And so you're actually not measuring apples with apples when you're looking at something that's come from warm to warm versus something that's come from cold to warm because your physiology of the plant has completely changed. You've gone through vernalisation and the plants are now wanting to put up their tillers. They want to be lignified stems. They've got to be um, baculated cells. And so you've actually got um, what we proposed here is this um, different system. And so if you're looking at it from a DNA basis, you've probably got less nuclei in a certain area of tissue. Um, you've got less cytoplasm because you've got these big vacuoles and you've got more structural fibre in that in terms of your lignin. So it's very hard to make those comparisons which have sort of just almost been assumed in, in the past. And so um, that's what we, we, we propose. And we think what this, what this essentially means is that um, this cold spell might be having more of an effect than we, when we thought it, it had. And, um, and we would really like to be able to take this work further. Um, I know it's been four years, but other things have come up, like nitrate leaching and plantain and, and other things on, on my desks. And so we haven't been able to, to um, put any more work onto this. What we are starting to look at now, we've got some slightly better um, management tools for the field um, production. And so we can start to look at where all our crops are produced and what the levels of, of endophyte are in those crops post fertilization. Um, at the, it's, that's a very difficult thing to do because of all your variables, unless you've got the same seed batch and the same genotype, the same endophyte, and you've got a good understanding of your management practices and that, they can all have effects as well. But this may be one that's, that's causing um, an effect to that end. And so with that, I'd just like to um, thank Ivana again, although she's not here. It's amazing what you can do in 12 weeks. And, um, and yeah, if there's any questions, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, well, um, Barenbrook uses Callaghan Innovation quite a lot for graduate interns over the summer, and it allows you to start looking at some of those small projects that you've got in the back of your mind, but you don't actually have the time to, to do them. They, have, they provide a student for 12 weeks, and um, you can, there's some very good students out there, and um, it allows you to have a look at these projects and see, and occasionally like this, you know, something of publishable quality comes, comes out. But in terms of where we're taking this forward, I think we might set up some more experiments to look in the glasshouse and controlled environment conditions and actually put them through different vernalisation treatments. But it would be actually, I think, better to go to the field and just have a better recording and data management of all the um, production variables and then try and be able to data mine that for differences to see if it happens. But particularly for you know, endophytes like AR37 and NEA12 and that, you know, that have got this production issue in terms of transmission and, and, and success into the next generation, um, it's a very important part of the business. So.